the burden. I have two sets of handouts today if you haven't picked one up. Okay, moving along. Uh, we had only one group left within the seedless vascular plants to look at. We are still within the Monilla phyta, but I had nothing to say about the Equisetopsida, which I will now, because uh, not only is it extremely unusual in the construction of the sporophyte, but it leads us into another topic as to the architecture of an evolution of trees later on. And as a group of surviving plants today, the Equisetopsida have definitely seen better days. And their, their day was during the Paleozoic, this late Devonian through the Carboniferous, in which they took the form of 18 meter high trees with a 45 centimeter thick trunk. And they, uh, they were no um, paleobotanists have given these tree forms the uh, name of calamites. Uh, what remains of them today, we have handouts, uh, what remains of them today are now reduced basically to the shore of um, uh, have been reduced to the shore of, uh, of freshwater sources and swamps and uh, seasonally mo moist dish, uh, ditches. These are known as uh, horse tails or mare's tails or under their own name of scouring rush. The name scouring rush become, uh, is due to this extremely unusual epidermis in which you have normal cellulose walls, but in between these are chinks of silicon dioxide. So they picked up a trick that we would normally associate with diatoms. They, uh, they in fact, produce this very gritty outer surface that some of you felt. And these seem to have been, for American colonists, American pioneers, the first Brillo pads. You cut them and you use them to scour pots. Um, there is a primary stem with a root, as you can see. It's horizontal again. It's a rhizome working its way through the mud. But they will produce secondary stems, which are photosynthetic. Uh, we're dealing with something that's making microfills and really shouldn't based on the production of a steel inside. More on that in a moment. But the feature of the secondary stem in the equisetums is that they seem to grow and stop and grow and stop almost like a series of orange juice cans, empty orange juice cans. Step, uh, um, stacked on, on each other. At the juncture in which one section of the secondary stem stops and another one begins, this is what we would refer to as a node because the little microfills appear at these node junctures like so forming a circle around the stem, but you've noticed in lab, a lot of them don't last. They're rather temporary and they just drop off. Uh, what should happen as we reach the tip of the stem is that we should, in fact, be producing a strobilus and the production of spores. This is a use for angiate system. In other species, um, sporangia emerge once again at these node junctures. You get a normal meiosis, but once again we've got something different and I sent you a um, I sent you a video on this. Each spore is armed with four elators. We've seen these hygroscopic hairs before in the liverworts. Uh, here you have four of these attached to each 
spore and in their drying out and wetting again, they bounce along, hopefully into a moister spot where they can germinate. Uh, when we get, and some of you did the cross-sections that are in your lab book, and what we tend to find is a very different setup than what we've seen in the other seedless vascular plants. Yes, it's like a U-steel, but it doesn't do everything that we expect a U-steel to do. We have this rough epidermis. Okay, we've been through that. Then we have a, uh, a ring of tissue referred to as the cortex, and this supports a series of air ducts. Remember, these often grow right on the edge of the water. It's important that they stay buoyant. It's important to keep floating, and they these are little mini flotation devices within the cortex. When we reach the tissue called the endodermis, on the other hand, we can see the beginnings of a U-steel. That is, there isn't one central core of vascular tissue. There isn't a core as a, um, a circle of tissue with pith in the center, as in the case of a siphonosteel. We have it broken up into a series of vascular strands, and then if we have a close look at the vascular strands, we're going to see something we're going to expect to see with seed plants along the way, in that we have a phloem which faces outward, always opposite the epidermis. There will be a strand of xylem attached to it, but something different has happened here. It's not pure phloem, it's pure xylem. You have another empty pocket. This is the Carino Canal. What's happened here is that in the development of the stem, this area once had its own xylem and phloem, its baby xylem and phloem, its proto xylem and proto phloem. They get used up, they get ripped, that becomes a canal, and what you have here is the production of a second group of xylem and phloem, a metaxylem, and a metaphloem in this particular case. But whatever it is, it's not good enough to form a megaphyll. So we're dealing with the uh, eusporangiate life cycle with these terminal cones or strobili. Uh, if we were to go through the life cycle, we would find that this is homosporous, uh, the sperm has uh, quite a few uh, flagella, and um, uh, but we're dealing with a bisexual gametophyte again, as we did in the true ferns. Which takes us now into a period of evolution, if we take this and move to the blue maps in here. What I'm going to be looking at uh, uh, briefly is this period of Pangaea in which virtually all of the modern continents are wedged together. This is about two, uh, 299 to 250 million years ago. Why are we looking at them? Because it is during this period where all the continents are locked together, even before the Permian. We can go back to the Devonian, and you can see in the front, I've given you all of the uh, various eras. Don't worry about it. But it is during this period, what we would think of as the Middle Devonian, between 387 to 374 million years ago, that seedless vascular plants are the dominant trees on this planet. But it's a very strange looking forest if you check the picture in your book. You can sort of think of it as the forest of giant broomsticks or the forest of giant telephone poles. Uh, that's because while seedless vascular plants uh, at this time could produce trees 
that were over 40 meters high. And it's hard to believe from the Devonian through the Carboniferous. In fact, these are the major sources of what we consider coal today. There's a lot of different plant groups in coal, uh, but these are a dominant part. But what you notice when you look at the pictures is that these plants didn't branch very much. If you look at the calamites, and also we've looked at the lycophyta, well, they were huge too, when we can think of the giant lycophytes. It was sort of like looking at a at a forest of things that are tall, have a certain degree of width, may be covered with little microfills for photosynthesis. They might bump out a smaller branch, but that's about as far as it goes. We even have other systems that are grow that are that grew. Uh, pretty much the way palm trees do today, in which leaves are only produced at the top, as in the case of some of the surviving uh, fern trees on this planet. You don't have branching to the point that you see something that looks like a Christmas tree, where the branches get wider towards the base. You certainly don't see something that you see in those videos of uh, rainforests with these huge trees which are seen to be forming giant umbrellas. You can't do that. Why can't you do that? Because based on the seals that they made, based on the cells that they made, they weren't very good at making what we think of as wood. We don't have a buildup of one group of wood cells after another forming rings. They reach a certain width, and that's it. And when you're dealing with something that's basically a big broom handle, you can't fix a large branch to it because of gravity. Eventually, it breaks and falls off. What you have to wait for, in the case of um, uh, the formation of secondary branches, are two things. The first of these in the stem is that of what we would call a vascular cambium. This is a series of let's see, this is a series of, of initial cells that are producing wood over a period of time. We think of them as rings, but in tropical areas they're not making rings. It's happening sequentially, pushing phloem towards the top and leaving xylem behind. And then you have to wait for the evolution of the modern wood cell in which the xylem cells lock together by means of these specialized regions of the cell wall that snap together and you have easy movement of water through them and this is these are referred to as pit pairs which you'll see in lab the week after next but we should make a point that modern wood does not begin until we have a vascular cambium and pit pairs and this seems to be something that the seedless vascular plants didn't quite uh, uh, do with. Not to mention, the for these forests of seedless vascular plants were tied to fresh water due to the life cycle of the spore and the teeny little gametophyte. Um, these trunks grew from rhizomes uh, growing through mud, pushing their way through and then just pushing up these huge secondary stems. Uh, virtually all seedless vascular plants that grow as trees are extinct now, with the exception of some of these rather shorter uh, seed ferns that you can find in the tropics and parts of the southern hemisphere. Uh, the only seedless, the seedless vascular plants that we are most likely to see today 
do not have woody tissue inside and are growing as, as herbs. What happened? Well, if you're paying attention to the uh, eras, what we have here is that there is a worldwide drought at the end of the Carboniferous about 280 million years ago. And uh, without a consistent moist source, you can't grow a gametophyte. And these huge tree-like things simply become extinct. But that's not the only reason. Uh, also, the fossils from the Carboniferous show that there has been a rise of a new group of trees, what we would think of as progymnosperms, which will be on this other handout. Now, the progymnosperms have been moving along um, uh, for quite some time. They're, they actually start to appear at the end of the uh, Paleozoic about 300 million years ago, and they slowly became more common, forming a dominant part of the forests by the end of the Carboniferous. It's very likely that these huge seedless vascular, um, uh, the seedless vascular trees were probably also pushed out by progymnosperms because progymnosperms at this point are producing modern wood, which means, first of all, their trunk gets wider and wider over time, and secondly, they can support a whole series of secondary branches and very likely are shading out the seedless vascular plant sporophytes that are trying to come up. What we notice about the early fossils of these progymnosperms is that they have prosteels and siphonosteels. They're still making spores, but the important feature is uh, they discovered the pit pair arrangement and the vascular cambium arrangement. So they got wider and branchier. This gives them increasing, uh, increasing girth and, and solidity. And they uh, certainly um, fossilized quite well. Uh, what we then begin to find, if you check your handout, is that something new is coming on. And it comes in in time for the, uh, per the late, for the Permian drought. What we see here now is this new group of trees, which in fact uh, has evolved a device that can deal with drought very nicely. And that is, anybody? Sorry, what? Yeah, what we're seeing now is the evolution of plants with seeds, if you have uh, seen your chapter. Uh, if we look at the, what's going on here, it means that everything is flip-flopped. The gametophyte no longer supports the sporophyte. The sporophyte is aiding the survival of the gametophyte. The gametophyte is parasitic on the sporophyte. It means with the production of a seed, the sporophyte can go dormant, be released by the parent into dry soil and just wait for some sort of seasonal rain, which is pretty much what seems to happen uh, these, uh, uh, these days. You see uh, from pictures in your book the uh, evolution of seeds over time. What's going on is in the case of the seed ferns, the Elkinsias, and its allies, you have a seed structure that is protected by these wisps of, uh, of tissue, what we would think of as integuments, and then you eventually go into a system in which these little integuments have fused together, 
there's going to be a pore at the top, a micro pile by which sperm can enter. And we're going to see uh, uh, on the inside of these systems, we're going to see a a mega sporangium in which you eventually form two eggs and while both may be fertilized by incoming sperm only one will develop into an embryo that will occupy the seed this flask or this flask in which the seed develops now, this protective structure, this will eventually become the modern seed coat that we see today. Okay. If you check the opposite side here, this is a series of drawings I no normally don't present until later. Uh, one thing we see in these early seeds is the formation of what we would call cupules. That is, what we see is that the reproductive structures, maybe twigs, appear on, on the branches as a series of twigs. There is a protective, probably brightly colored pair of leaves. These are the cupules. And we find that at the base of the cupules, there will be one, sometimes depending on the species, there may be two of these undeveloped seeds. When we talk about undeveloped seeds that have not been fertilized yet with sperm and are, and are still in this virgin state, we refer to these as ovules. Each one will contain a megasporangium that is going to have at least two eggs in it. Each of these is waiting for the uh, arrival of sperm with its little fluted or low tops, so there's a hole here. That's your micropile, which means that at this point we understand that these trees are probably on separate branches producing uh, other structures that are going to be releasing pollen. And we understand now that th this is what the whole flip-flop has been about. Pollen grains are, of course, haploid. The eggs inside of these, uh, inside of the megasporangium, are haploid. So what we have to understand then is when we deal with seed plants, pollen grains are merely male gametophytes because if you look inside there will be at least one sperm cell, sometimes more, which in turn may be attached to another cell, more on this in the future, and inside of the megasporangium, the entire megasporangium will contain some sort of embryo sac, sometimes it's just a couple of eggs, and this is the female gametophyte. And this is what we are looking at today, and it is the dominant terrestrial plant life this is what's producing most of the cellulose that we're seeing. But we have variation in how you make your seeds, how you arrange the anatomy inside of your seeds. 
So once again, if we flip up the, um, this particular one and go to the next page, we see that there are differences between what we would call gymnosperms and angiosperms. And furthermore, there's going to be a division within what we call angiosperms. What are we talking about? Well, you're going to be seeing them in lab this week. Gymnosperms, gymno, sperma meaning seed. Sorry, that's, it, it simply means seed. Gymnos meaning naked. In a gymnosperm, we find that both the ovule and the mature seed are exposed on a scale uh, made by the plant, and they're often shaded by some sort of broad, protected leaf known as a bract. So what we find in the case of most of the surviving gymnosperms is two ovules, each with its own little micropyle, resting on a scale And this, in turn, may have extra protection because the scale will be sitting at the base of a much bigger, protective, hard, shingle-like bract. So when you think of it, a pine cone, a pine cone is a series of bracts, each bract should be protecting a scale on which one or two of these little seeds are forming. Things are different in the angiosperms. Angio meaning either a flask or a box. This includes everything that we think of as flowering plants. Uh, what we expect to see here is very different. Instead of the seed forming exposed to the air in a gymnosperm, we expect that in flowering plants, in flowering plants, the connection between sperm and ovule is indirect. In the case of a gymnosperm, pollen grains will land on the micropyle. What usually happens is the micropyle produces a sticky drop, a pollination drop, and they're eventually sucked into the ovule where they will meet up with a uh, where, they will, where they will release their sperm and the sperm meets up with an egg. Doesn't happen here in the angiosperms. We expect that the pollen grain will land on a sticky, specially modified structure in the flower called a stigma. It produces a pollen tube in which the sperm is kept which will grow down through this neck-like structure called a style. And then it goes looking for ovules inside of this closed ovary. So we find that ovules in an angiosperm are not exposed to the air when they're ready to receive pollen. They are attached in some way to the inner wall of the ovary, usually by some stalk of placental tissue. They will also have a micropyle, but they are waiting to receive the pollen tube, which uh, will release the sperm into the embryo sac inside. Don't worry about that yet. We'll have a much closer look at the embryo sacs uh, in weeks to come. So when we consider the gymnosperms first, uh, these came in after the progymnosperms. 
they certainly differentiated. There were at least eight orders, excuse me, there were at least eight phyla of them, and five do exist today. They still exist, but not that many species compared to the angiosperms. There are variations on how they um, produce their ovules and expose their ovules. Not all of them make cones. Uh, we can think of ginkgos and yews that have different me methods of handling it. In the case of the ginkgos, it's really very simple. They just produce a spore shoot. There is a unequal pair of ovules. They're as naked as you can get. There's a little micropile at the end. They seem to be wearing these fleshy turtleneck sweaters, um, uh, regarded as a corona, and, that, and that's pretty much it. And yeah, hanging there, they do look like a pair of testicles, which tends to, expand, which tends to explain why in Asian medicine uh, they're sort of for male problems. These, the seeds become for male problems. Uh, otherwise, in others like the U, we have the production of one ovule sitting in a very fleshy cup referred to as an arrow. This attracts birds which eat the fleshy cup and disperse the seeds. So there's variation in how gymnosperms reproduce, but not as much as we see in the um, in the angiosperms.